Good afternoon, and welcome to our live webcast of Open Book, Open Mind Online with Mary Roach, talking about her new book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. I'm Arielle Zeitlin, one of the librarians at Montclair Public Library. And first, I'd just like to draw your attention to the Q&A button. If you're using a computer or a smartphone, it's at the bottom of your screen. If you're using a tablet, it's at the top of your screen. That's how you can send us your questions for the Q&A. And it's also how you can ask for live tech help from my librarian co-host, Selwa Shami, at any time during the webcast. Now, I'd like to introduce Gina Chung Fort, a member of the board of our library foundation. Welcome, Gina. Thanks, Ariel. It's good to see you again. We're so happy you're all here for another virtual webcast of Open Book, Open Mind. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Montclair Public Library Foundation. We're a group of your friends and neighbors, and our mission is to raise money to fund the offerings that make our library so special. This includes library programs like this one, staff development, building restoration, and other needs that aren't covered by city funding. Your donations support everything from laptop lending, Wi-Fi hotspots for Montclair residents without internet access, to lifelong learning classes, homework tutoring and resume help, to the children's reading programs, and most recently, the significant growth in e-content during the pandemic. So after you enjoy this event, please make a donation through our website, montclairplf.org. Gifts of all sizes have an impact, and the library needs your support now more than ever. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the program. Thank you so much for all that you do, Gina. And if anyone in the audience wants to contribute to the library in other ways, please search for Friends of the Montclair Public Library on our website or on Facebook. Now, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Mary Roach or as her conversation partner, Lulu Miller described her, the awesomeness that is the roach. Mary is a true original. Um, her New York Times bestsellers include Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, Gulp, Adventures in the Alimentary Canal, and Packing for Mars, The Curious Science of Life in the Void. And her books have been published in 21 languages. She lives in the Bay Area. Welcome, Mary. Mary, we can't we can't hear you. You need to turn on your uh, unmute. That's it. There we go. Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you for it's lovely to be here. Wonderful. Um, Mary's new book, Fuzz: When Nature Breaks the Law, just came out last week, and it's available for purchase at our program partners, Watch on Booksellers in Montclair, and will soon be available to borrow from the library. Now, I'm also very happy to introduce Mary's conversation partner, Lulu Miller. Lulu co-founded NPR's Invisibilia, a show about human behavior, and was a producer at NPR's Radio Lab for five years. Lulu is also the author of her own very well-regarded nonfiction book, Why Fish Don't Exist, a story of lo loss, love, and the hidden order of life about an early biologist and eugenicist. Welcome, Lulu. Get my unmute down. Thank you, Ariel. It is, yeah, it's just like, I was just thinking, it's like a pleasure club sandwich to be here for libraries and then to be here for Mary Roach, who honestly, my whole career I have admired and I'm a little starstruck, but I'm gonna play cool for the people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm so happy, so happy to be here. Thank you. Well, we think you guys are the perfect pairing. <laughs> and this is the moment everybody's been waiting for. And for all of you at home, please remember that you can start submitting your questions while this conversation is going on. And now on with the show. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. And one more thanks to all the listeners out there in virtual land. Um, Zoom is weird, but we're making our best. And, um, and it's, so, it's so great to have everyone here. Mary, I just was saying a little bit about this before we, we got going, but this book is so fantastic. I mean, you are... Everything you do is fantastic, so it's, re it's redundant, but to watch you take your sensibility, both your sense of story, 
your humor, but then that ability to kind of peel back to the deeper meaning behind the quirky, um, in this case, obviously collision between humans and animals, um, but, but what is actually at play beneath that? Every chapter, I, I was I was underlining, I was ooing and eyeing. This is it's such a good read, and and for this moment, you know where we all are continually claustrophobic and alone. To be able to kind of peer into nature, you take us to different places. And I guess, I mean, that actually is a quick question. Was most of the reporting pre-COVID because you got to journey? Yeah, yeah, it was almost entirely done. Um, <clears throat> it, when Mar uh, in March when COVID hit, I think I had one chapter that I was going to report in Toronto had to do with raccoons. And I remember being on the phone with United Airlines and the guy goes, yeah, well, the border's closed. I was like, what do you mean? The border's closed, what? You know, and then, right. and, and, and I remember saying, yeah, okay, do you think I could probably push things back to May? Everything will be fine by May, right? Just this like, no clue. Anyway, the raccoons got, uh, got the ax, no raccoons. Yeah, I was gonna say, but, I don't recall that chapter. Yeah, yeah sayonara <laughs> raccoons. So the, yeah, no, I was so lucky because I, I would have been absolutely derailed. I couldn't have done, I could have done any of the reporting. I mean, a couple of, I guess, historical elements, but just, it would have, I felt so bad for anybody who's in the middle of reporting yeah. a, a, bo a book that required them to travel a lot because the, you, you just, and, and to, you know, to step aside for a big chunk of time, you just lose your momentum. It would be horrible. So I was pretty lucky with the timing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and thank you for what, right just, thank you. What, let me just thank one... you for what you said. <laughs> oh, of <laughs> course. I'm, I'm going to do half. Okay. I'm going to do half more of a soliloquy and then don't worry, people in the audience, we're going to, we're going to get to the questions and the content of this fascinating book but I do I don't even know if you know this but when I was starting out in radio um I was kind of behind the scenes a producer on the line when you gave one of my favorite interviews of all time I was working for Radio Lab, and you talked about um Thomas Lynn Bradford um who was a spiritualist who wanted very earnestly to find out what happened after death and you know on one hand it's this court story from over 100 years ago where you do you want to share what he did he was the um, the the um, in the code guy, right? Was yeah, he he, he, he knows he without guy. a doubt. He was the guy who took his own yeah. life, and he had a psychic buddy. Oh yeah, that one, right, right, right. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, yes, he decided. Here's how we prove it. Um, I'm going to die at my, by my own hand, and I've told a buddy. Okay, this is this is what I'm going to transmit to you um after i die and then therefore we'll have proof and of course i'm going like you could have just told her <laughs> like how do, <laughs> yeah. we know, how do we know you didn't just tell her <laughs> but um yeah. You know, yeah but that was and it was such a poignant because it was reported you know in the, it's over several days in the new york times i remember and then it was yeah. you know um uh, bradford is silent from the beyond you know just kind of a a sad ending but anyway yeah, that was um and you uh, it was a great I'll I'll share the link here, but I remember just thinking like the way you brought that to life with the showing, you know, it's not just the quirk. Like, yes, on one hand it's a punchline. Science sciencey guy kills himself to see if there's life beyond and will report back to his psychic friend silence from the beyond or whatever. But then you go through, you know, and you think about her choice to not lie and how it's kind of honorable in this strange way. And and yeah. And then you bring in a little bit, it's, it's like a perfect seven minutes of radio and I will, I will share it here. But I remember then just thinking, gosh, I, I just so admire how you pull people in and then have kind of dignity and actual curiosity about the things you are looking at. And, and it's this incredible sweet spot that just plays out so well in the book, thing after thing. So um, to begin. Oh, well, yeah. Well, th thank you. I also you, remember about that interview that I had a bad cold and I don't sound, oh. I sound very uh, nasal, but anyway, you, <laughs> that's. You oh I thought you were kind of horsey. You had the Demi Moore. I thought it was great. I thought you had a great voice. Yeah, I had but, sounded um, like I've been I smoked two packs of cigarettes or something. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Just it really uh, it upped the intrigue. But what um okay so this <laughs> whole world of things you know like you you've looked around in guts and you've looked around at dead bodies and all this stuff. What was there an anecdote? Was there a story, a person that drew you into this world? Or was it a broader hunger for animals and nature? I mean, how, how was this what what your next journey was? 
Uh, it, there was a woman, well, it was a hodgepodge of things. You know, I never have a tidy origin story for my books or rarely. Uh, it, yeah, it was this woman, Bonnie Yates, and she published this. Uh, well, at first it was a paper and then it was a guide for wildlife enforcement professionals. And the title is, I believe, um, How to Distinguish Real Versus Fake Tiger Penis. <laughs> because uh, she works for the forensics lab uh, up in Ashland, Oregon, the National Wildlife Forensics Laboratory. And I was like, that's kind of an interesting world. And I communicated with her and I, and I tend to, when I'm looking for book topics, I kind of, um, I'll start with a nugget and then I'll think, what book would you build around this? Rather than thinking, here's a book topic. You know, I kind of come to it inside out. So I th kind of thought, I, I don't know, I'm just going to go up there and talk to her. She, she was amazing. I mean, she has the, the world's largest hair library, which is just the hairs of, because you know, she's looking at contraband that's coming into the United States, you know, people smuggling in pieces and parts of endangered species and, she, you know, which is a crime. So she's got this amazing reference library of hair, animal hair, like for one animal, there'd be like guard hairs and whiskers and the down underneath the main fur and, 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 she, anyway, there, th that was just this amazing day speaking with her and then uh, learning about a case. The ca they were investigating a case of head headless walruses. And I'm like, you need to have the headless walruses in here. And what book would I put? I was getting all excited. And then the director of the lab, I went in to meet the director and he said, because uh, I said, I'd like to follow up shadow and investigator and, you know, do the thing that I do, which is travel around and, and uh, report kind of on the scene. And He's like, no, you can't. It, it legally, you legally, you cannot be part of an open investigation. So the door kind of slams shut, and so I kind of picked up my pieces and went off in some other random directions, and then realized I could kind of turn it around. And instead of wildlife as the victims, what about wildlife as the perpetrators? And I stumbled onto this this odd 1906 book, The Criminal Prosecution and Capital Punishment of Animals, which is about how in the 16 and 15 and 16 and 1700s, animals would actually be um, put on trial, and animals and insects, which I thought, what? <laughs> you know, that was a kind of a bizarre, that kind of sealed the deal for me because I started thinking, oh, I could arrange it by crime, you know, breaking and entering, manslaughter, <laughs> jaywalking, trespassing, littering, van. I mean, could go crime by crime. And obviously animals don't commit crimes, those are, the laws are written for us. But that was the progression. See, it's not a tidy story. I never have the tidy, I'm so jealous of <laughs> No, this the, is great. The tidy origin story, like the, you know, the, the obsession with, so like, you know, for why fish don't exist, you have this wonderful rabbit hole that you get to, you know, go down that of course takes several <laughs> amazing unexpected turns. Um, but I, I didn't, I didn't have that. So that's kind of how it, no, but that's about. interesting. You got, you were sucked in, you were sort of blocked as a reporter and then you found your way to stay in. And, and so, okay, well, let's start, let's start with the big, with the big crime. So probably murder, kill, kill, when an animal kills yeah. a person um, is one of the places you start. And um, I just have to share the side note detail of the, the animal trials that you bring up. It's the case of these caterpillars, which the farmers <laughs> are mad at for being pests. And then you had the great line of they'd probably pupated and weren't even caterpillars anymore by the time of the trial. I love that. But um, okay, so so murder, when, human, when animals kill humans is kind of our first big chapter where you really go in. So just for broad orientation, like what happens if an animal kills a human in the United States or let's say Canada in, sure. in this region? What happens sure, to sure. that animal? Sure. Well, what, what, the, the, what I reported on was that there was this, this training session. It's a five-day course uh, called Wildlife Human Attack Response Training. And these, uh, it's people who work for wildlife agencies who take this class and get certified. So when somebody has been killed by an animal, they've been found, obviously mauled, mm, not that odd, could have been a person. Uh, so, so people come in who are forensic experts and who are First of all, taxed with figuring out who, what species did this? Was it a bear? Was it a human? Was it a cougar? Uh, and you can sort of, you can tell by looking at the wounds, the type of wounds, you know, the claw marks and the teeth marks. And for this training session, we were working on these soft touch mannequins, which were based on actual attack victims. They've gone and the, like the, the people who run the course had actually 
created some of these, recreated these, what these wounds would look like on these soft touch mannequins. And the thing was being held in a casino with a bingo game going on next door. So it was a very, just my kind of scene to write up, just this hilariously surreal juxtaposition of mauling victims and then bingo in the next, <laughs> in the next room. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the, when there is, when somebody is killed like that, there's a, it, it's similar to like CSI where they put the yellow tape, crime scene tape, they're gathering evidence, they're looking at the blood splatter patterns, they're collecting uh, DNA from the body of the person who was killed. And if they've shot an animal on the scene, um, then they're, they, they, what they do is um, check to make sure that that was in fact the animal that did the killing. Sometimes they'll put a, you know, a trap. And if they, if they trap a, say a bear, they have a suspect in, in essence, they have a, a, an animal suspect. So they're gonna look at the, uh, the evidence between the victim and the animal, often DNA, but sometimes you can just do it with uh, teeth marks, you know, just measuring the canine to canine teeth marks and you can figure it out that way. And if it's not that bear, the suspect is released. I love that, or it should be yeah. if they're doing it right. Um, and yeah. that, yeah, I mean, there was a story up in, of a woman who's killed up in Canada where there's, I think, it, where was she? Saskatchewan, maybe. Anyway, there's a lot of bears up there and they ended up uh, trapping two that were not the bear that had killed the woman and they were both released, you know, like a, like somebody who'd been wrongly accused of a crime. So, so they, um, that, that's kind of what happens. You know, they're either released or uh, unfortunately, in the case that uh, if they if they kill somebody, they're um, it, it's it's capital punishment for the for the animal in this country anyway. And and so yeah, you go through this this whole training, this whole world, um, and it has that the acronym of wart, <laughs> wart <laughs> <laughs> which your guy says is an unfortunate acronym, yeah. but it is so fascinating. I mean, the minute you let us through that, and it's a very serious you know, work of linkages and that you kind of, you share these examples where actually it was a human that killed someone, but it looked like a cougar attack or there was the, the guy they were able to determine, like sadly had, had, you know, had died from an overdose. And then they realized the bear came to him after and wasn't yeah. that, and, and that was sort of fair. And, and like the, all these nuances of, of trying to figure out what happened. Um, the, the description, some of the descriptions, like they have that roach, they've got the dry humor and the surreal, but then they're, they're, they're so hard. Like the, the flayed eyelids or like the neck. I mean, did it as someone who loves the wilderness, did seeing this stuff so vividly freak you out or, or, or did you kind of calm yourself with the statistics of how rare it was? I mean, did it have an effect yeah, on yeah. Your, your, yeah, I don't know. In, in any real way, did that change your, it, your well, it was, the um, creatures? It, the, the yeah, statistics that I got also a heavy dose of the statistics that week uh, for, yeah. uh, for both mountain lions and bears and the attacks are so rare. I mean, there's so many people have so many encounters with bears every day and they're just look, there's a bear and they kind of, you know, lumber by or whatever. They're, I mean, they're so there. It, it's just so uncommon that anybody is hurt in this country between zero and three people a year are killed by bears, you know, and like, which is far less than dogs or snakes. Um, so, so the statistics are very, very comforting. However, those mannequins were horrifying, just, just like, um, because bears um, apply the tactics that they use if they fight each other. So they go kind of teeth to teeth and they go for the face because it's lightly furred. So that's just their instinct. So they, you know, they're, they're, there's these terrible wounds to the head, but I think the other thing that kind of mitigated the horror was just the the, the people putting it on. It's these was these guys from Canada, and they have the classic Canadian guy accent, which is you know. So you, you hear something like an and you know I don't know if I'm going to get the accent right, but this guy describing having found a, a, a victim, and he was saying you know it was pretty it was pretty grisly, like. Uh, the head hanging on by two, three tendons, right? You know, <laughs> just this <laughs> and the combination of the accent and the subject matter um, just uh, was kind of um, not really hilarious, wouldn't be the word, but uh, the kind of thing that I love to kind of write up, you know? Yeah. And you also, tendons, you also right, you know? 
<laughs> knock yourself when you're you're watching the hockey game and you're like, shouldn't it be the Maple Leafs? And then you just kind of go <laughs> leaves. Anyways, um, yeah. ooh, a thing that made us depressed. So then you know you also talk about the kind of I guess lesser crime of bear breaking and entering and and getting into cars and liking minivans over other cars because there's usually candy and kid to try yeah. this in them. Um, but why then what made a surprise, I guess, appearance for me was the link to climate change and how climate change is a part of the story of at least increased encounters in some areas. And, yeah. and can you just kind of sure. spell that out a little bit for people? Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Um, I, I spent time in, as you know, in, uh, up in Pitkin County, Colorado, which includes Aspen, and um, they have a lot of bear conflict. I mean, when I, while I was, from the time the bears came out of hibernation in the spring to when I was there in late fall, I think 421 conflict calls of bears damaging property or breaking in to houses, raiding refrigerators, et cetera. But one of, and one of the things the researcher, I was traveling with a researcher, Stuart Breck, and he said, um, you know, he had been, I, don't, I can't remember if it was his study or someone else's, but they looked at um, the effects of rising temperature on the length of hibernation. So if you go up two degrees Fahrenheit, the, the hibernation period shrinks by a week. So that's another week that bears are gonna be out on the land looking for food, coming into conflict with people. And they did projections out to 2050 and it was up to uh, 40 extra, 40 fewer days of hibernation. So that's a, that's a, a lot more uh, conflict calls. And, and unfortunately, by the time a bear starts habitually breaking into homes, sometimes when people are there, uh, you know, cause they realize, oh, there's lots of good food in that refrigerator. So I'm just gonna do it. I've gotten away with it, seems pretty okay. Uh, and eventually uh, someone will call the wildlife agency. And, it, and at that point, you know, the bears are considered a threat to public safety and they're, um, they put a trap and then if they catch the bear, it'll be, you know, usually it's put down because it's, it, you know, it's gonna train its cubs. It's just, it, it's a, there's a lot of recidivism in the, in the world of bear crime. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but the climate change issue was, um, it, it kept coming up. I mean, I wasn't reporting on climate change, but it came up in a few places in the book um, just because it's so front and center these days. Yeah. So, okay. So now I want to jump. So we, we hear of these like zero to three bear, fatal bear attacks a year in, in, at least in the States. And then these, and then, you know, these other cases where maybe a bear is getting too dependent on a human situation and some of those bears need to be put down. And then you take us over a couple chapters later, you take us over to India to what's called the elephant corridor um, in the north. And what, I mean, how many people roughly in the, you, you have this number of just, you know, in five years, it was like around 400 mm -hmm. people who are killed by elephants, which first of all was like a total shock to me. Um, and so what, can you tell us a little bit about who, what, what world you focused on there and what the approach is to a problem, a similar problem and wild, majestic wild animal killing humans um, at a much bigger rate? And, and what is the approach? What does it look like there? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's a fairly small region where they have the, over the five year span, that number. I mean, in, in all of India, 500 people, this is hard for me to believe, but 500 people a year killed by, Elephants. I mean, I mean, obviously, the population of India is a lot bigger, um, but the uh, the elephants tend to be up in the north of India, and they they move along through this. They call it the elephant corridor, which I like because it's sort of picture a hallway in a school or something. <laughs> elephants, Full of elephants. Yeah, the, the corridor, um, and that corridor has become kind of fragmented for various reasons. Um, you know, military installations, um, refugees coming in from Bangladesh, Nepal. Uh, housing developments. So the elephants get kind of stuck and then they kind of start running out of resources and they turn to farmers crops and that's when things uh, get hairy because the elephants are usually out after dark and people uh, in these villages get pretty upset. Obviously, you know, they're relying on the, what they grow to survive and uh, a group of an elephants travel in big groups. They're social animals. They, you know, say eight or ten will move through, even if they didn't eat anything. Just walking across the field, they trample a, a lot of uh, a lot of what these people have, you know, spent the whole season gr uh, growing. And so they get upset, and people tend to run out 
and it's dark and they're yelling and they've got maybe fire on a stick or firecrackers and they the elephants start to scatter and when you break apart the social unit the elephants are very freaked out they panic mm -hmm. they're running around uh and it's it, somebody invariably somebody gets trampled or knocked over and when you're in the midst of a pack of elephants uh, that that's often fatal so it's not that elephants are just you know are stalking and you know bludgeoning people it's it's usually just the by dint of their size and their their base a lot of them are tramplings that happen so um the response i traveled with a researcher who uh helps communities set up elephant response teams and and he trains them in you know, better ways first of all how just it's like wildlife crime prevention like how to um prevent these situations and you can do everything from uh, having a, a text, you know, texting the elephant response team, and they come in a vehicle. They're not on foot because it's much safer to be in a vehicle. Uh, apparently, still very dangerous. They wouldn't let me do a ride along. I'm like, come on, really? Yeah. Are you sure? I can't do a ride. It's very dangerous. I'm like, come on, they're elephants. <laughs> How dangerous could it be? You know, I, they, it was hard for me to absorb that fact that they're very dangerous. I'd be like, let's, there's an elephant crossing sign down there. I'm just going to go hang out. Would that be okay? They're like, no, <laughs> no, yeah. you're, you're not going to do that. That's, you know, or, or we're coming with you. You know, it was, uh, uh, so, uh, but the elephant, the other interesting thing about elephants and elephant con human conflict is that uh, because there's, because the Hinduism has various animal gods uh like Ganesh the elephant god there's kind of a lovely built-in reverence and fondness for these creatures even if they're you know knocking the wall down and stealing the grain in your in your in your kind of bodega that you're um that you sell material from uh the the woman who ran that bodega which had just been smashed uh I talked to her I mean it was just it was a you know the corrugated metal just sort of bent like it was cardboard and and I said, do you get angry? And do you, you know, do you wish someone would come in and, and destroy this animal? Because it was, a, I think, the second or third time it had happened to her. And she said, no, why would you kill God? And, you know, mm -hmm. we just, we just say namaste and please go away. And uh, there isn't that kind of anger, um, and which is, which is lovely. Um, there's a different approach in, in India. The government is supposed to anyway, the government compensates families if someone's killed by a leopard or an elephant um, they're given a, a cash payment rather than tracking the animal down and and killing it although there are instances with there's a region in the Himalayas where leopards uh, actually stalk and kill people which they don't do in other parts of India uh, people have kind of become a favored prey uh, and in that case they will after I think they have a there's a three strikes rule <laughs> if yeah. it's um if it's if this animal is clearly if it's a pattern, then they will bring in someone to to kill the animal. Because they and sadly, it's often children that are are attacked and killed in this region. So and anyway, yeah, it's a, it's it's just an interesting. Different cultures have their own way of dealing with it. Yeah, I mean that was one of my. I feel I feel like in the next chat. So you, I think you went elephants and then into the the leopards and and it felt like in the leopard you kind of hinted at it in the lion section with this woman, which again was such a lovely part of it where you're going around with the research team and the people with the odd job, like one of the glorious parts of this book is some of the jobs. It's like economic <laughs> ornithologist, tree danger specialist, the names sound like band yeah. names. They could each be a, band, a metal band <laughs> yes. and they're like, someone gets paid dues, this is wild. Um, but the, yeah, but then you really, yeah, you meet this woman and you show us the devastation of, you know, and now we're beyond all of our, like our associations with, with elephants and, and you show us like her, her, her livelihood is, is totally destroyed and she's in a panic, she's in a chaos. And yet through that, her attitude, the kind of in intimacy and power of like through that, that her attitude still doesn't go to anger. Um, and, and so you're kind of, you're exploring different approaches to this situation, which is, and you're doing it both through sort of actual intimate experiences, but also through policies. Um, and in the leopard chapter, I, I, I think there was, um, you said you kind of talked about the nuance approach to this idea that you're not going to immediately kill an animal for killing a human there because they value the animals and there's not the same degree of like, 
eye for an eye and they compensate the family and they, they acknowledge the trauma in other ways. They think about justice when you're think, which is already so weird with animals that don't, you know, understand, yeah. but that they, they've come to all these different ways. And, and you said, you know, occasionally in the journey of reporting this, you would encounter that back here in the States and you, sh and, 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 and then you shared the story of the guy who was like a rancher who said, look, when you're in the business of livestock, you're going to have dead stock. Um, right. And, yeah. and this, this idea that like, um, yeah, to think about these conflicts that, that, that there are so many different ways to approach that. And I guess, um, yeah, I think I, I wonder in, in a very real way, like you, you worked with, all, you looked at all these different people who are specializing in animal human conflict. Um, did going into this make you, or, or seeing all this, did it, did it start to make you think, to zoom out for a second, about conflict, but even between humans differently? Or were there lessons for you, not just about this particular question of humans and animals, but in general for how to, how to handle conflict? Like, were, were there broad lessons for you? Yeah, there were. The, uh, I kept coming up over and over against this, this feeling that uh, the, in the United States, there are just two very polarized takes on animal-human conflict. There's the, um, I just want to go out and kill them because they just killed my llama or my goats or whatever, and uh, I, I'm pissed off, and it's my right. They killed my property, and I'm going to... So there's, there's that and you know don't tell me what to do or not do don't tell me how to manage my property and my farm or my ranch so there's that and then there's don't harm a single animal the animals should be treated equally to the people i mean so there's these and it just kept reminding just felt so red and blue politics it just it was just so america right now uh that that was um uh kind of a thing that initially made me feel kind of hopeless because I feel like that, you know, the polarization politically uh, in this country feels kind of hopeless. Um, but I, but the, I didn't come away entirely hopeless just because there's, there's been some wonderful work going on with organizations promoting coexistence. And, uh, but, and particularly this is with uh, large carnivores like wolves, because that, that is the most polarized, uh, area right now and 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 I talked to somebody who at one of these organizations and I said well how are you how can you possibly you know, what do you do and he said well it starts with bringing into a room people who never sit down together in a room and not just getting them to talk but getting them to listen and hopefully to understand the other person's perspective and where they're coming from you know and he, he said it you know it felt they he had just done some big conference that had to do with reintroducing wolves and he said it it, the, after the first day, people sort of settled down and there were really some meaningful conversations. And, and, and hopefully, you know, the trick is to get people, you know, when they go back to their own corners, you know, to, to, to bring those thoughts and inclinations with them. Um, but the other thing he was talking about is that le legislation should be made by groups that include all these constituents, yeah. not just somebody, some political body going, okay, this is, here's, the, here's the law we wrote up, you guys vote on it. Don't, don't people people who make these decisions should be people invested in it who really know it not just don't throw it out to the public who don't really understand both sides at all it's just voting from the heart it's just very emotional and that's not the best way to draft legislation that is meaningful and that people will stick to so um it was i ended up feeling more hopeful i would say yeah. about it um just because of that you know that there, there's a lot more of that going on because the people in wildlife management have realized it's it's really hard to change animal behavior. So let's try to let's try to work on human behavior. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's so and as in any form of criminal justice, prevention is so much more effective than punishment. Uh, so um, you know that was yeah you know, maybe I'm kind of poly being a Pollyanna, but it did feel it, it. I took a little hope from that and from some of the changes that. Uh, wildlife services, some of their, their uh, in 12 states, they've hired non-lethal specialists. In other words, if, a, you know, if, a, if a, somebody who has backyard livestock or a rancher uh, complains about predators, uh, the first line is to go in and say, you know, let, let us help you build a better nighttime enclosure, or let's cut back some of this brush where the mountain lions can be hiding before they, you know, sneak up on your 
chickens or your goats or whatever. So, or, or even, you know, range riders, they're paying to have people, you know, be out with flocks kind of uh, troubleshooting and, and looking out for, you know, is there any denning wolves nearby? Can you, you know, graze these animals more in a group so they're not so spread out? There's what, you know, there are, there are ways to prevent conflict and rather than just paying lip service to it, there's been, there's been more of an effort uh, at wildlife services to, um, to, to help do the, some of these things. People dedicated to the non-lethal um, solutions, which is great because the history of that world is, is pretty ugly, you know, just a lot of slaughtering. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I found that part of the book where you just, I, I actually like, yeah, I experienced hope in that part because what's so, I mean, the topic is so revelatory because like anytime humans are trying to, you know, regulate animals, you see just this, you just see hypocrisy, you see morals, you see values, like it is a rich way of, it's a rich topic to write about. And, and you see that in the States, you see it in different cultures. And it's, it's, it's kind of like fun and writerly in that way, where you're just, you're just going to see humans trying to moralize nature and trying to control it and try to justify things. And and then, but then, yeah, where there really were these concrete moments, I, I was really struck by that part with the, where where the the people met the ranchers and the farmers and the hunters, and they actually talked, and they actually each kind of turned their dial a little, and mm -hmm. and the hackles came down, and that idea of like the approach shouldn't just be make a law and then sue them and fight, like like mm -hmm. let's actually have councils on these decisions yeah. and because there are there there's more Venn diagrams there's more overlap between yeah. all of us when we're allowed to talk and and then also just I guess um I mean in the idea you know that you do give concrete takeaways the concept of coexistence that's an attitude shift the concept of talking that's a yeah. that's an actual tact you know like a tangible thing you can do and then prevention which you just gestured at I mean you had this line that like the real thing that causes you know, bear death or, or human attacks is, is garbage. Um, and, and, and I don't know, what about, I mean, how effective is prevention? You talk about prevention being the thing that might really help with, yeah. with bear attacks and how could that work yeah. and what do we, what does it actually take? Yeah, well, um, it's not enough just to have the bear resistant garbage containers. You have to actually have laws making it a findable offense to not use them or to not close them properly. And the place where I was, um, Aspen and Pitkin County, Colorado, they have the containers and they have the laws, but they don't have enough personnel to enforce them. And mm -hmm. they, there was a study done where they looked at uh, areas. I'm not sure if that was in Aspen or Steam, Steamboat Springs. There, there was a number of, it doesn't matter. Where, they looked, where the study was <laughs> done in Colorado, um, they compared areas where there was only 10% compliance versus areas where there was 80% compliance and a huge difference. You know, there, there was like 42 calls in the, the good area and in the area where nobody bothers, it was like 270. I don't have, the, like the numbers are approximate, but it does, it does make a difference, but there's so many, you know, so anytime anybody says, why don't you just use bear resistant containers? What's the problem? All right, well, let's look at, this is ski resort town. Uh, a lot of these are vacation rentals. The houses are, are vacant. For large portions of the year. So, you know, bears, it's easy, bears are more likely to break into an empty house. And when people do come from out of town, they're not from bear country. They don't know what they're supposed to do, or they don't care. They don't know the consequences for the bears. So they don't bother. Or you've got a condo development with 20 different units and one big dumpster. How do you know who, who gets the fine? How do you know who left it unlocked? So um, the practicalities of legislation are, and, and compliance are really difficult. They're really, some communities do it really well and it, show, it, sh it shows in the, in the number of um, complaints about conflicts, it, it really does help. And you sometimes have to, like this one community that, that does do it well, Snowmass, the woman there, uh, Tina White, you know, it's not, she, she, kind of, she really thinks about it. Like she's like, okay, the restaurant owners know because they're the ones that get fined, okay? They know that they have to lock this thing but all of their staff don't, don't necessarily know, why do we have to lock this thing? So she went in and did these presentations in English yeah. and in Spanish and like explained, this is what happens when these bears start raiding garbage bins. Eventually there's gonna be a complaint and a trap will be set and they're gonna be killed. 
So that's right. why you need to lock the container. They, they didn't know. I mean, they're in a hurry. They're running out. They got a bag of garbage. Yeah. They don't. They don't know why they're being asked to do this annoying thing because those those bear resistant dumpster things are tr they're tricky. They keep the yeah. bear, but they're actually I had a little difficulty locking one of those. So um, wow. anyway, I don't even know what question. No, I'm but it's well, about. just that prevention might you know like you were saying yeah. in, in any crime that like that maybe the path one of the concrete paths for it is prevention and that that's not it doesn't just take awareness and attitudes that like anything else to change human behavior. You need someone yeah. going around, you need resources to write tickets. And I yeah. just, that that line you had about, I'm forgetting his name now, but the the guy who works Harley? on bears and the wildlife biologist who, yeah, who said now oh, my God, it's human behavior. And like what yes, a strange yeah. shift, but if you care about the animals, like I think it, in a lot of these cases, it's like to make change that the nature of your work has to change. Like he just wanted to study bears and now to save yeah. them, he has to study humans. Um, exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, I know we're soon, we, we, we're gonna turn to the people with their questions. So keep throwing them in the Q and A and anything and everything. I mean, we, okay, like just so you know, people listening, other topics in the book, she talks about trees. She talks about killer legumes. legumes. Um, <laughs> she talks about mice, we've got monkeys. Um, I okay. I'm 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 split on whether to go to language or crow effigies, but I think I gotta go to crow effigies. Okay, so this was possibly my favorite just like world of the book. Oh, the, the effigies. Crow, the, or the vulture, sorry, vulture, crow, the, yeah. the vulture effigies. Um Yeah. So weird. Okay, yeah. can you so yeah, 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 yeah. and how they work? So can you just can you just take the people, can you just tell them a little bit about what these are, what bird scarers are? what these are and how they work and why they work. I mean, just, just introduce yeah, yeah, us yeah, to yeah. that Well, I have a, uh, th thank you for bringing up the effigies. Uh, I nobody ever asks about the effigies. Oh, the effigies. The effigies. <laughs> so um, the eff effigies work, okay. So vultures can be, uh, vultures like to roost on big communications towers and they tend to just sit and, and crap. And it makes, if you gotta go up and repair or do any work on there, it's slippery, dangerous, and gross. So they don't, they don't want them to be up there. So, um, and, and, and this researcher, the National Wildlife Research Center accidentally figured this out. He saw that, a, um, oh, no, he, needed to, he needed to kill a vulture because he was uh, trying to create a, um, it's a long story, but they have a chicken gun and they were trying to figure out the density, but it doesn't matter. He had to shoot a vulture to get its dense body density. So it was up on this gantry because it's an old NASA facility. And, and he shot this bird and it was hanging upside down on this gantry that the vultures like to roost on and hanging upside down with its wings kind of out. And he's like, from that moment on, no vulture would come near. They would not roost there. They never came back. And I was like, whoa. Could this be kind of an, is this, is this something? Like, should we, you know, so first he tried just putting out a dead vulture, which did nothing. It had to be mm -hmm. hanging upside down, kind of swinging with its wings out. <laughs> and it was, it would freak out the other vultures. They would not come near. And so vulture effigies, uh, you can purchase them. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to get, no vulture need be harmed in the making of an effigy. Um, it helps to have some feathers, like the tail and the wing, to actually have some vulture parts, but the body could be styrofoam and you hang it up and ta-da, the vultures stay away. And this is something that has been tried in um, <laughs> down in the Everglades. They have a lot of problems with vultures vandalizing cars. Well, it's, the whole thing is so mysterious. Like, why do the effigies work? You know, and there's a tendency mm -hmm. to want to say, Oh, because they looked at it and they thought, I'm not coming near that. You know, that's, I don't want to end up like that. But that's kind of a lot for a vulture brain to really be processing. Uh, and, and, and the only thing they could think of was just, it's just really strange and freaky. They kind of recognize the bird, but it's upside down and they stay away. Vultures kept away. Yeah. And I, so there's like in, instruction manuals for how to construct, uh, uh, your, you know, DIY vulture effigies. Uh, but they anyway, what I was going to say, they use them in the Everglades because vultures come and they they vandalize windshield wipers and they pull the seals off cars and, you know, around the sunroof uh, and they cause problems. So the people at the park in the Everglades hung some effigies in the trees around the parking lot 
and it did keep the vultures away. But then the rangers spent all day calming people down who were just freaked out by these, <laughs> by these like really creepy sort of satanic hey, like, looking yes. birds hanging dead upside down, even though they weren't real birds. So eventually they just put a bunch of tarps out and said, cover your car with a tarp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, vultures will tear up your windshield wipers. Anyway, I love vultures. I oh my gosh. <laughs> I I mean, and and in terms of your craft, like this was a moment where you, you know, you vary your pacing a lot, and where we're taken into a scene. And this was kind of like there's bird scares, and there's professions, and there's robotic falcons, and there's the chicken guns, which was the lovely footnote. And there's like, blah, blah, blah. and then you, and then it like <laughs> turns into like a Brecht play. Where, where you, this was one of my favorite parts of the book, but you have this extended conversation with the man about why it works. And, and he just is like, he just kind of did what you do, but you get to hear the dialogue and he, and he finally just confesses like, we don't know. And it's so fascinating because they, they do habituate, they, they seem to habituate to things that are actually scary. They seem to habituate yes. to like certain things, but that there's this effigy, like maybe it's as you write about it and as he kind of fumbles toward it, maybe it just had, does have this aura of, as you were saying, like sheer confusion and mystery. And that alone yeah. seems to be yeah. unhabituatable. I mean, it just, I love yeah. the idea that like of all the scarecrows, the more surreal and strange, like that might be the durable way to scare them. Right. And, and it just, I don't know. I love that whole world and, and the, the series of human accidents you have to get there to have learned that. And then yeah. him just finally saying, I don't know. And it, it's yeah. such lovely dialogue. It's such a great part in the book. <laughs> um, oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. The effigies um, were I, amazing. Yeah. Yep. I, yeah. Um, so of, I guess one, well, okay. Of all the, I don't know, of all the worlds you discovered, because again, you take us into all these different creatures, all these different worlds, all these different corners of the globe. Um, but the real thrill is for me was these professions that exist, these people who are paid to, to have these wild jobs. I think very few of us realize are out there keeping, trying to keep us safe, trying to keep animals safe from us, trying to keep things in balance in very strange ways. And, and um, I get, was there a, a job or a, a world that was just the most kind of surprising to you? Like what was the one yeah. of all of them? I don't know. I think that the world of the um, the macaques, the rhesus macaques in New Delhi uh, was my kind of my favorite in terms of how endlessly bizarre and entertaining it, uh, it, it was to see uh, how how the city is trying to cope with it. Cause it, it, is, it is complicated by the fact that again, monkeys, Hanuman, the monkey God, People want the problem. These macaques are, you know, they steal things. They grab cell phones and ransom them for fruit. They jump onto balconies and scare people who fall off the balconies and die. I mean, they, they're causing all kinds of mischief and people want the problem to stop, but they do not want anything done to the monkeys. They don't want them harmed. Mm. They don't want them trapped. They don't want them caught. They don't want them sterilized even. They just feel that it's it's disrespectful because the monkeys, they and, and they, they make offerings to the monkeys, you know, outside the temple. So they're encouraging them. You know, everybody knows the worst thing you can do is, is start feeding an animal because now you're going to attract more of them and they're going to get more aggressive. You know, they're going to realize, you know, I could I can wait for them to hand it to me or I can just grab it, you know, and or I can slap the person, which apparently they sometimes do. But the the way so so to try to figure out what to do with this, the the um, the city government at one point hired men with bigger monkeys, langers, to scare off the macaques. So they would just walk around with these bigger monkeys to freak out the smaller monkeys. And, and then at a certain point, people complain because the Wildlife Protection Act, you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to have these monkeys in captivity. So then um, they would just come in surreptitiously and, and have the langer urinate on the building. To, to, so there were people, apparently somehow gathering langer urine because there was this quote in a New York Times article from some years back where they interviewed the man with the langer, the, the urinating langers. And he said, I have 65 langers urinating on prominent homes. And I just thought, <laughs> wow, that is a really interesting occupation. Interesting little business <laughs> that you have. And then at, certain, at, some, at some point after they were like, you can't use langer, you can't hold langers in captivity. Then the government 
hired and trained people to impersonate the Langer's calls. <laughs> so there were these men, and there, you could see them on the internet. They're just sort of walking around, men kind of wearing slacks and a shirt, just walking around making these Langer calls to frighten away the macaques. Again, it's like, you know, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I, I do Langer impersonations. <laughs> yeah. Throughout the neighborhood. <laughs> It's a, and, and in that story, I mean, in, in the way that climate change keeps showing up as like the secondary character in this book, language itself is maybe the third character where, where like, do we classify them as vermin or pests yeah. or not? And then the different agencies of saying like, this is a city problem. This is a wildlife problem. I yeah. don't want it. I don't want it. And, and just yeah, yeah. how many contradictions like the, yeah. those monkeys, the macaques hold. Um, it's such a fascinating chapter that I think like lays bare, yeah, just how how hypocritical we can be when we're tight. Yeah. We like about animals yeah. and we don't want them. And, yeah, and we noted yeah, yeah. that the the macaques you kind of liked because they are pests to mostly rich people. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, like if yeah. you've got yeah, this one woman, this attorney who filed suit on behalf of her housing development, which is upscale. Um, she was saying, you know, they they want properties with you know they like to be in the trees so they go from the trees to the roof jump to the balcony go into the window and she said prime minister modi goes to the same health club that she does and the language the, the macaques are getting in the swimming pool she said they're in the halls of parliament we see wow. them in chambers they're running around yeah. in chambers you know uh which uh it's just kind of amazing and the, the poor guy in the city veterinary department saying these are wild animals. This is not my job. You need to speak to the forest department. Ishwar Singh, do you know his number? Here it is. And then I, you know, I'd call Dr. Ishwar Singh and he'd say, these animals are no longer wild. They're in a city. They're not part of the forest department. So they're like passing it back and forth and nobody knows what to do with it. And you could tell this, but at one point the guy just goes, what would you do? What would you do about it? You know, just like, help me. I, I, I'm open to anything. Because it is, it's such a, um, and, and the media goes crazy. I mean, they've got descriptions of monkeys marching in armies from one side of Agra to the other, in, in armies, <laughs> like they've got rifles. Just, oh. uh, just it was uh, the, the kind of scenario that uh, I love to step into. <laughs> um, okay, the questions, I'm going to go to the people because the questions are rolling in. I, could, I literally have five more pages, but I'm going to hold them for now. <laughs> Um, okay, so okay, so Mary Jane Carp uh, is wondering if in India is there any strategy for keeping the elephant corridor open as a way to avoid the destruction? Uh, yeah, and, would, and would that work? Right. And, yeah. Yes, that would be absolutely the best thing. Absolutely the best thing. Unfortunately, um, the welfare of elephants is not uh, the top priority, and uh, there, especially you know the the military, the military because there's you know, tensions with China. There's a lot of um, a lot of beefing up of military facilities near that border. Uh, so, and, and the refugee situation, there are things that are difficult to control. You know, I mean, you can do things like when you plan where to put a road in. And I mean, in the United States, there's a little bit of effort made toward that, making sure you don't um, separate, you know, uh, you know se separate a group of animals or prevent them from migrating, you know, from higher to ele lower elevations to look for food. You know, you put a road in and then what are they supposed to do? So there are people uh, who try to make that a priority, or to have you know build an overpass so that the animals can migrate. I, that's that's the um, the number one goal of anybody involved in human elephant conflict. But it, it's an uphill battle. You know, there's yeah. just a, um, a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of powerful entities that don't really have the elephants' interests at heart. But but absolutely, that would be the best approach. Yeah. Wow. Good, great question. I didn't even yeah. occur to me. Um, the, okay, another one that, that came in is, is okay, do bears, do you know if bears actually prefer garbage or is their behavior a consequence of a shrinking habitat? Um, and and like, for instance, in Montclair, yeah. their bears, yeah. Do you know That's a that? great question. You, yeah. um, apparently, what, what I'm told is that what bears, when bears are getting ready, ready to hibernate, what they want is a concentrated source of calories. Like, they, they don't want to, you know, they want to expend the fewest calories searching for calories so that the net amount of calories is highest. So a big dumpster full of scraps from three or four restaurants is concentrated food source nirvana. So, um, they, I mean, they're like, anyone, anyway, they're a little bit lazy. They're like, I could get, you know, rather than going around and um, 
eating acorns and choke cherries and and um, what's the other one that they have there? Um, crab apples, rather than sort of wandering around and, and, and looking and eating lots of little items, you know, to be able to go, oh, here's like a big bag of leftover salmon and mashed potatoes and burrata. And I mean, they're, um, they're omnivores, they'll eat anything pretty much. And so um, I, I think they have, they have a preference for easy fattening, uh, large sources. So easy okay. calories. They do, they do have a preference for. I can't say whether they prefer the leftover <laughs> salmon to the acorns, that I don't know. But I do, they do yeah. have very specific preferences. Like when they break into homes, apparently they prefer the premium ice cream brand. They, they <laughs> oh yeah. There's something called like Western family ice cream, which is the low rent. No, they I'm won't not. do that with their, they're like, no. they want the Ben and Jerry's. They want it, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm told. <laughs> oh God, the side note of just like, the bears, yeah, the bears' dexterity and the, the unwrapping of a Hershey kiss. The story oh, is amazing, they, yeah. Yeah, that, um, okay, the, we could go off on fun facts, but I'll, I'll yeah. keep it, I'll rein it in. Um, uh, okay, so we have another question. Is it fair to say that over the course of evolutionary history, domestication is essentially a long, domestication is essentially a long form way of resolving human animal conflict? Oh, could we just domesticate the bears? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, well, that definitely does resolve the conflict uh, to to domesticate a species. Well, although you uh, although you know, uh, fifteen people every year are killed in dog in, in fatal dog attacks. So, um, I suppose you know we we have a different set of conflicts with uh, domesticated animals. So uh, I don't know. I don't really know the answer to that question, but it's an interesting thought, and I. Uh, I'd, I'd love to have a pet bear, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you did you encounter, this is from Chris, did you encounter any information about magpies and their tendency to hoard shiny things? Um, I imagine some enterprising person having an interesting side hustle, tracking down magpie nests and returning <gasps> stolen items <laughs> or yeah. anything about the shiny. Oh my God, yeah. I should have had a magpie chapter. <laughs> Damn. Damn, that would be great. They're like pickpockets. They're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I wonder about that. Um, somebody, I just heard something about um, rodents like to um, steal, like, like hoard things and that, and that people, what was it? It was like when somebody's, someone dies and they, they're, they're, they're missing things that were in the pockets or something. They'll look in the burrows of the roof rats. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the area because they sometimes hoard stuff um but wow. anyway yeah magpie nests that makes me we've got we've got oh no they're mockingbirds sorry we don't have magpies around the neighborhood <laughs> but, it, but it makes me want to go look in a magpie nest it would be kind of like the people with the metal detectors you know, it could mm -hmm. be the people who go and point it up <laughs> exactly look in magpie nests i love that um this is this is from Christy just kind of commenting that it's too bad the raccoons didn't get in the book. They are such cute, fierce bandits. Not a question. But then it makes me wonder what I was, know. What was the raccoon thing going to be? What was the world of raccoons well, that you um, couldn't go see? Uh, up in T Toronto, and I don't know if it's just a, a media phenomenon, but there was there's all these stories about Toronto being overrun by raccoons. So I was just going. I, I it was going to be. You know, I have this. At the end of the book, a, a resource guide for uh, what you know, humane solutions for animals getting into your world and your attic, you know, eating your cat's food, whatever, whatever it is. Just sort of a, and I was rather than just sort of a resource resource guide, I was going to travel around with this guy who um, helps people deal with the raccoons and other animals in a humane way. So it would have been more of a reported on the scene version of that. Um, uh, it's kind of an appendix to the book. And I wish I could have done that. I really would have loved because I, I love raccoons. We've got like seven of them that troop through the backyard on a regular basis. And uh, um, I love it when I happen to see that, hear that they're down there. Yeah. I know. This, yeah. Side question out of that one. I mean, did, did writing this change any behaviors for you, big or small, um, or even just attitudes? I don't know. Like, did the process of writing. Yeah. Yeah, change it. Yeah, very, very more, more so with the the little guys. Um, I, I ended up feeling really bad for rodents and birds that uh, get in the way of agriculture because they're just there's just um, there's no real um, breaks on 
exterminating the, uh, them or not exterminating, that's the wrong word, but uh, just sort of calling in the exterminator and you know, um, setting up those you know, gas bombs in the burrows of the rodents that come into agriculture or um, poisoning the birds. They're, they're, you know, they're, we have these pretty specific guidelines for how to euthanize lab animals. We don't have any, there's nothing like that for agricultural pests. I don't even like the word pest, you know, because I think it just puts these animals in the context of our world. And it also gives us a kind of permission to just call mm -hmm. someone to deal with it. And the way they're often dealt with is just to kill them. And there's ways to prevent the problem. There's ways to, to exclude them, to discourage them, to lure them somewhere else. There's, there's still lots of things you can try that are actually more effective um, in terms of, you know, agricultural problems. So. Uh, I, and I and I don't think they get the same kind of love that uh, bears and cougars do, you know, because yeah. they're, you know, they, they just they're all over the place, and we just kind of don't really give them a lot of thought. But they're they're smart and beautiful, so yeah. I think I I ended up becoming a little more of a softy when it comes to, you know, rodents and sparrows and all the things that we get in them. pigeons, <laughs> pigeons, vermin, <laughs> vermin, vermin. Roach yeah. comes full circle into <laughs> fans of pests, <laughs> obsession. Um, okay, this one is from Mary Jane. Did did they or do you have any ideas why vultures were going after windshield wipers? Yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> Here's the, there are various, there, first there was this theory that there was a, uh, they were off gassing a smell that somehow overlapped with the smell of carry-on. Uh, but that doesn't that project uh, lost its funding before <laughs> they could really figure it out. It was a little complicated. So that didn't seem to be the answer. And my favorite theory, okay, when vultures come descend on a cadaver, a corpse, a carcass, that's the word I want, a carcass, um, it's kind of like this avian scrum where they're all in there and they're like kind of elbowing each other. Do they have elbows? They do, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're coming in there. And so they're using you know, their beaks and they're pulling it apart. And, it, and the, the, this guy was saying, I'm forgetting his name, it's in the book, uh, a, he's a, a bird guy. And he was saying that the, the tensile strength and stretchiness of, of muscle and tendon is similar to the rubber on uh, windshield wipers and the seals that are around the sunroof. So they're kind of, it's almost like an exercise regimen, like they're uh, learning how to be better <laughs> at pulling things apart. Oh, it's, a, it's just a theory. It's just a theory. I, I, he doesn't know, obviously. Uh, nobody knows. Yeah. But that I liked that one a lot because it it's didn't like seem to be. That, like, what was that 90s workout band? Yeah, like with the, the rubber bands. Flags. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, um, that was my favorite theory, whether or not that's why they do it. Um, and, and there's a number of, there's a, uh, the Kia, which is a, a mountain <laughs> parrot in New Zealand, which eats carrion also, carcasses. Uh, they do that. They in the, in the national park parking lots. You, you sometimes see them pulling apart um, car, bits and pieces, stretchy bits and pieces of cars. So wow. and so uh, cara caras. I think there were a number of these birds that do that, and and that was I, which was a, a great theory. I don't know whether it's true, but uh, <laughs> I love it. I love that. I, I, yeah, me too. Um, this is from Francis in the book. Do you discuss deer and how they uh, have become a vector for Lyme disease? Lyme disease is a horrible scourge, but it's not the deer's fault. They just have no right. more habitat and the ticks don't die in the winter anymore. Yeah, that, yeah, I don't, I didn't get into ticks. Uh, I have a whole chapter on, on jaywalking deer and deer in the headlights. And there's an interesting project, which we don't really have time to get into here, but no, no, not the, not Lyme disease in this book. No. Um, I will say just side note, one of one of another one of my favorite meditations in the book is what feels like a question that's relevant for many professions. How do you count what you can't see? Um, and you have this kind of chapter on the the elusive um, cougar and 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 this idea of like, oh, spottings have gone up at least in California, but is it that's is it that they're more or is it that we have better home cameras and more of us have cameras? Yeah. And, then, and then you have the whole meditation which usually I'm not actually a fan of like scatological adventures, but <laughs> your the, the, the whole section on people who have to count scat as a way of understanding yeah, what's yeah. out there is a so fascinating. And this turn of like, as you put it, learned men, <laughs> like <laughs> their job becomes just snooping, snooping and, on the toilet of woodland animals. Yeah. 
but the writing in that section I mean I was listening to that part on on tape and I was laughing I was grinning ear to ear I was walking <laughs> I was laughing so hard it's so funny but it's fascinating of like all so these approaches to well yeah. then you have to know how often they poop and how much and then you have to weigh it and then it was and I, know, and I love that too and yeah exactly and I loved and I loved the um the animals that walk while they're dunging he called the, the researcher called them peripatetic dungers <laughs> so you're like <laughs> is this three different antelope or just one walking and crapping you know how do yeah. you figure that out so all of the, the nitty gritty I just science the, these pockets of science are so fascinating to me they're so fascinating and and yeah it's a genius way to go about it um okay I, yeah. I've got one I, I definitely want to ask but one more came in there the question was are there octopi in the book which I don't think there are right there are no octopi no, unless no, I'm forgetting no, no. okay and then one was um how would you advise the guy who asked you what to do about the urban monkeys gone wild? Well, um, I said to him, you know, they, they're, they're after, cause, cause I had just come from Aspen. So I said, well, what if you got your garbage problem under control? And he looked at me like, this is New Delhi. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> and he said, also the, the monkeys are not really going on garbage. They're going, they're, they're getting into people's kitchens and um, they're, get they're being given handouts and they've tried to find they put signs up saying that it's illegal to feed the monkeys but they don't ever enforce it so um what would i say um it's a really tough problem to get people to stop feeding them because they have a, a religious motivation to 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 get to offer food to these animals so how do you how do you counter that um i i know i guess just um acceptance and um acceptance slash resignation. I don't know what the answer is. It's really, I mean, the, the chapter is actually about birth control and, and the challenges of putting wild animals on birth control. Like if it's oral, you, you know, you can't like, how do you make sure they take, they take it at the right time. It's hard enough to get people to take their birth control at the right time. Uh, and, yeah. and if uh, with a vaccine, you have to do a booster. So you have to round them up for the second shot in six months, hard enough to get people to get their their yeah. second shot for a vaccine so that's that is and they're free-ranging animals and you'd have to mark them to know who's had the first one I mean that's got some promise but the challenges are so steep I just um I think I think this problem has existed for a long time and and will continue to exist um and I don't, I don't have I don't, I don't have the answer either yeah but good <laughs> you just question. get to document a great question you just get to document all our attempts to answer it yeah I mean, the, the, the birth control that was another one the whole world of people trying to control pest populations or, or various yeah. populations through these through oral contraceptives through, through the genetic modification yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, or sterilization even you yeah, know or yeah, these yeah. gels and the you know oh my god is, yeah is, I mean a it was shocking how common it, it seems like this is a big way that all kinds of different people are trying yeah. to control different populations but is there a moral I mean is this a place that you've seen moral opposition or like is is the debate on whether or not we can sterilize oh, or to, cut to off control lot? Yeah, to, to, the birth, birth to the birth Are control in, it, in India. Like I, I spoke to this guy, there's two states where the, they have managed to get an exception to the Wildlife Protection Act by declaring monkeys vermin. And that gives them permission to uh, alter the population to, well, to actually to trap, I think even to kill. But what they're trying to do is sterilize them, uh, catching them and doing vasectomies laparoscopic sterilizations little like yeah they are fast they have these monkey sterilization centers and they're they're doing hundreds <laughs> i forget how many a day but it's it's a tremendous number um and he told me the one reason we're looking into the uh, immunocontraceptive vaccine is that people people feel that it's wrong to capture the monkeys to sedate them to do surgery you know that the, that that doing like a, a a shot would be more human. They, they sterilization. But it would because, still be, but it would still be preventing them from having offspring. So it would be, it would be the same. Yeah, effect, no, it was. Yeah, the, it was more the that the monkey catcher. The method. Yeah. yeah the, the method. You know, catching them. They're not going to do it nicely. They're going to be um, rough with them. You know that they have to. You know, you're they're having surgery. They're gonna. They sometimes pull out the stitches. So people are against that. So. Um, which is, of course, you know, the government's like, what do you want us to do? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, so it's it's a very uh, kind of an impossible challenge. Yeah. Um, okay, this is maybe an unfair question to ask at the very end. As we're late in the day, you've been so eloquent. But I guess I wonder, so this will be my last one. I'll see if anything else comes in in the Q&A. But um, feel free. But um, I mean, what, what do you think you are really after? And like what unites all your books and your, your research quests? Obviously, you change. <laughs> over obviously you change and, and your interests change but like I, I mean one thing I see in my is like you're interested in these areas where we're confused about what to do or what you know is yes. there life after death where we're really confused and we we soberly slather science or policy over it and, and then you you kind of like push it you find the most odd examples that that, that reveal our yearnings and, and our attempts to kind of wrangle confusion but also reveal our hypocrisy. Okay, so that's like, that's one commonality I see, but what are you, like, I don't know, what are you up to really? Like, is it adventuring? <laughs> is it oddity? People call you quirky, but you're deep. Like what you are doing is really, I think really deep and you don't, you don't hit us over the head with meaning, but you leave these, you dangle these subtexts, these questions and implications for us to ponder. Um, I'm talking a lot. Well, how would you like? What do you, What are you really up to? What is it about for you? Uh, well, I I love what that analysis that you just what you just said is the most coherent and eloquent <laughs> kind of description and summary of of what I do. And a lot of it is unconscious. I'm getting I I step into a book just because I've become fascinated by some pocket of the world that I didn't know existed, and that it seems like a fun place to spend a couple of years. Uh, I'm, you know, to be honest, I, I, I want to make sure that it holds my attention and the reader, I was looking for topics that people might find interesting, but when you spend two years in one of these areas, and I'm trying to think if, if, if I'm, if, if this is true of any topic that you step into that you're eventually going to get, you know, you peel away the layers of the onion and you get to some core of it and you, and you have to address that in a, book, you know, even if I, I get attracted to something for the kind of surreal scenes and people and, and the surprising elements of it, I, I think after a couple of years, uh, you, you, you can't not take it to that level in, in some way. And, and like you said, it's not, um, it's not the main thrust of the book. I don't really have a thesis that I'm, that would be obvious to somebody um, until they've read the book. You know, you think you come away with some it was something. Uh, I don't know if that really answers the question. I think you answered the question better. No, than but it that. does. No, I love that. It's like you want to go somewhere where there will, where it will hold your attention. Well, there will be fun and there will be confusion and you're open to the thesis. I mean, I, I won't spoil it, but I think you're ending with the man in the white hat and his, yeah. his approach. Yeah. He's a guy in a barn inundated with mice. And, um, and it's really beautiful writing there. And I think obviously you didn't go in knowing you'd find him, you found him no. and then you took us and it's, yeah. it's really special. Oh, well, thank you. I think, I think uh, uh, I stumble onto moments where I, when they happen and this happened with Grunt too, it was the first place that I went. It was the morgue at Dover, Grunt, uh, the Curious Science of Humans at War. And I knew that that would be the end of the book in some way. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, I, I do, there's a moment where I kind of realize this is what, this is at the heart of this book and this is where I'll probably end up. But um, I don't seek it out because I don't know anything when I start, you know, I, I yeah. just start as a complete idiot. I, I, I have no clue what lies in this world. And that's part of why I love doing what I do. I love to just step into these little pockets of the world that I, I had no, no idea existed and just see what makes them tick and, and what makes these people tick and what are they, I'm, now I'm saying tick and I'm thinking of the scourge of ticks. <laughs> but, <laughs> tick, maybe um, tick will be your next one. Tick, yeah, it's a great title. Yeah, Time. one syllable ends in CK. Yeah. Always a good one, yeah. <laughs> tick. Great. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, thank you for summing it up that way because I think that that feels right. Um, well, I will turn us over back over to Ariel from, from Montclair Public Library. Mary, thank you for writing this and letting us come with you on the journey. It was Oh, so Lulu, much fun. thank you. It was so great to yeah. hang out with you. And so yes. I so much enjoyed it. And, um, and, and I'm a huge supporter and, and believer in libraries. I was basically raised in a library because my dad was 65 when I was born and he would just go 
<laughs> drop me in the children's section. So like librarians were my daycare. Truly. Wow. <laughs> so I love libraries. I can picture where the Tintin books were in the stacks and the Black <laughs> Stallion books and, and it's all in my head. So, and I, and I rely on libraries and archives all the time in what I do. So anyway, thank you all so very much. Yeah. Um, well, Mary and Lulu, thank you so much, both of you for coming to Open Book, Open Mind and for this fun, lively and pretty much irresistible discussion. Um, and uh, I wanna thank everybody here for coming today because without you, we're nothing. And um, I all, so Fuzz is available for sale by our partner, Watch on Booksellers <laughs> in Montclair. It's also going to be available through the library. Um, and I want to uh, thank our uh, Montclair Library Foundation also for funding the series. But really um, what I wanna ask the audience is to consider buying the book because um, if you care about books and you care about authors, and you want them to be able to keep writing the books that they do and um, bringing these provocative ideas out into the world where we can appreciate them and joining writers like Mary on her, you know, thrilling adventures, then, um, you know, you will support them in the most sincere way possible, which is to actually own one of their books. Um, and uh, finally, we hope that you'll join us for our next event, which is with um, acclaimed novelist, Alice Hoffman on Thursday, October 14th at 7 p.m. She'll be talking about the grand finale of her best-selling pra practical magic series, The Book of Magic with Elizabeth Egan of the New York Times Book Review. Be well, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks again.